Um, our speaker today comes highly recommended by Mandy, our resident historian, um, Dr. Kelly D. Mazurik, who joined the Walsh University faculty in 2000, is a full professor teaching upper division U.S. history classes, so she knows what she's talking about. She's a lifelong resident of Ohio, earned a Bachelor of Arts in History and a Master of Arts in Public History from Baldwin Wallace, and then she achieved a PhD, she really knows what she's doing, in 19th century history from Kent State University. Kelly is the advisor for the Walsh University chapter of Phi Alpha Theta, which is the Honor Society of History, past executive board member of the Ohio Academy of History, a former representative on the Ohio Civil War 150 Advisory Committee and coordinator of the Walsh Constitution Day program. She was awarded in the 2019 Now Civil War Fellowship at the University of Virginia. Her book, For Their Own Cause, is right up here. Uh, it's a beautiful book, and it was a finalist for the 2017 Ohioana Book Award for Nonfiction. Please welcome historian, author, and professor Kelly Missouri. Hello, everybody. All right, let's get the sound. Is it working? Yes? You can't hear me? Okay, I'm very loud, but I can talk louder. If we pull this out, you won't have to lean okay. in so much. We have to keep Nancy happy. All right, let's try that again. Can you hear me? Great. Yes? Thank you, and thank you for being here on what's turning out to be a very beautiful February afternoon in Ohio. Um, I am used to talking longer, so please, um, if I go over something a little too quickly or I don't give you enough details, I'm hanging out uh, afterwards and would be happy uh, to answer your questions. So let's see how this works. Where do I point it at? The computer? There we go. So thank you to Margie and the entire Maslin Museum. You, I, if, I'm sure you know, but what a treasure you have here. What a treasure. And um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be part of the programming. All right, I always like to start with this just very quickly. How many of you have not seen Glory? Okay. Not, not a lot. So listen, watch it if you want to learn more about this topic for Hollywood. It does a really good job with certain parts. And the parts that I'm talking about is showing the diversity of men who serve in the United States colored troops. Not all are enslaved people. There, so you can look for him, right? I don't think you'll see him. Okay. That I did not, I don't think I knew that, so thank you. Um, but, it, but it really shows the diversity of men who served in the United States colored troops. Most people talk or write about them as all formerly enslaved men. About three quarters were enslaved or formerly enslaved men, but a significant number were free men. They were educated men. They believed in preserving the nation. They wanted to seek citizenship rights. So while the abolition of slavery is utmost for almost every one of these men who serve, you can get an idea of the other men and the other reasons that they're involved. I think it could do a little bit better of a job showing the diversity of the white officers, but it's Hollywood, so we'll give them a little break. All right, I also like to start with this slide for anybody that doesn't have any uh, familiarity with the United States Colored Troops. Um, first of all, the Emancipation Proclamation is not when black troops started to serve in the American Civil War. We had the first Kansas, uh, without permission, um, serving in the summer of 62 in battle, and then once we start to see some more approval uh, through Lincoln and the War Department, the first South Carolina, and then a month later the first Louisiana. But most people trace it to this, the final Emancipation Proclamation. The initial one, released in September, did not free any enslaved people. It said that if the 11 states in rebellion returned by January 1, 1863, they could keep their enslaved property. 
So, so it didn't free anybody. And when none of those states returned, we see the final released January 1. And not only did Lincoln, President Lincoln, claim that he was freeing enslaved people in those states and areas in rebellion, he added this very important paragraph that said, not only am I freeing enslaved men, I will allow them to enlist in the military. And that is when most of the men will join after this. In May of 1863, the War Department creates the Bureau of Colored Troops. This is what will oversee the organization of these federal regiments. They will not have state designations like Ohio's other regiments, okay? We also see that at least 180,000 men served in the United States Colored Troops and as black sailors. This matters. This is almost 10% of all U.S. forces. So they play a significant role, not a minor role. We can see that we have um, 163 full regiments, but we also have some units, so it brings it up to a little higher. We can see um, 449 military engagements all the way from skirmishes to full significant battles. They serve in segregated units, as I said, federally designated with white officers. Initially, these men received less pay. That is equalized in the summer of 1864. And by the end of the war, there are a handful of black men who do receive commissioned offices, but these are not to lead men into battle. Not all African Americans supported this. We can see this particularly early in the war through the black churches, black ministers, arguing there is no reason to fight for a war that didn't um, recognize them as citizens. Here in Ohio, there was a school teacher in Cincinnati, a black man who came out and said, don't do this. Why would you help these people fight? Why would you risk your life? When we are not recognized as citizens, we do not have equality. And you can see that the number of African-American men who died in service, like white soldiers, mostly due to disease, is at a much higher rate than white soldiers. And this has to do with the inadequate and unequal medical care that is provided to black soldiers throughout the war. And again, we want to understand that overall, we can never forget this, as much as I'm gonna share um, accomplishments and contributions today. Overall, these men faced discrimination. They faced unequal treatment, unequal supplies. That came not only from the enemy, but from their own nation and their own army. So how did Ohioans react to this idea of black men helping to fight in the Civil War? We're not gonna read this. I just want you to see uh, where this came from. Um, Ohio, right from the beginning, said that black men will not be in our militia, and this follows upon a 1792 federal law that prohibited black men from service. Having said that, African Americans fought in every single war, and they're going to fight or at least assist even before the Bureau of Colored Troops is created. But the initial reaction in April of 1861, when Lincoln calls for his first troops, when black men from Ohio try to enlist, that next day, they are told to go home. Gover governor Dennison, the first of our wartime governors, is not interested. This is a white man's war to preserve the Union and nothing else. But we do see black men right before and during the first years of the Civil War attempt to provide some assistance in some way, even going back to John Brown's raid. Several free African Americans, as well as several formerly enslaved men, joined John Brown. And here we can see Lewis Sheridan Leary and John Copeland from Oberlin. Both will give their life. And John Copeland writes home and says, don't, don't cry for me. I couldn't do anything better than try to end slavery. If this is a way that I can show black men are willing to fight. And again, this is before the Civil War. We have in Ohio the Black Brigade. And this is in the summer, uh, late summer of 1862, when there's a fear that Ohio will be invaded by Confederates through Kentucky across the river. And so under martial law, we will see almost 1,000 African American men, many conscripted, sent to Kentucky to build the defenses, 
to prevent an invasion. Many of these men will go on to join the United States Colored Troops, but as they are released from duty, they are told by their white officer in the Black Brigade that they had used picks and shovels, and they have proven their willingness, and next, he promised, they would be able to carry guns. Other ways that black men helped, and this is um, before and during the Civil War, James Bray is from Bell Fountain, Ohio, and before the war, he is with uh, a white officer. He's not literally a servant for, for Fitzhugh Lee. He's with a white officer with Fitzhugh Lee, and they're in Texas. This is with the U.S. Army. The idea that these men were paid and enslavers took their uh, enslaved men with them is not unusual throughout the US military. Officers took somebody to help them cook their food, keep their uniforms clean. But when the war breaks out, Bray comes home. He comes home and he is going to serve then as a paid servant for an officer in the 54th Ohio. Remember, he's not allowed to enroll himself, he's not allowed to enlist, but he can go. Well, once the um, state of Massachusetts starts enlisting black men, Bray says goodbye, <laughs> and he heads to Massachusetts and joins the 55th Massachusetts, which is a segregated regiment of, of black men, the sister regiment to the 54th. And he will earn the rank of sergeant. He is injured and comes back to Ohio. He recovers and joins the 27th United States Colored Troops, the second black regiment from Ohio. How hard this man tried to serve the United States, right? Denied rights, but he is going to try this in every way. And you have examples of this right here in Maslin, Ohio. I've learned of a new uh, man earlier, so I'll get to add him to my talk next time. But here you can see veterans of the 13th. They are wearing ribbons from their fifth reunion. And Moses Harris, I have circled in yellow there. And he was a paid servant. Right? He went and he helped the, one of these officers. Again, not an uncommon way to contribute before black men could serve in the military. So once black men are given permission through Lincoln's first Emancipation Proclamation and then as the Bureau of Colored Troops is developed, we see people go to now the second war governor, Governor Todd. And he says, no, I don't care what they're doing in other states. We are not interested. And so John Mercer Langston, center top, and down below him to the right, OSB wall. These are black men from Ohio, prominent men in their community. They will be paid recruiters for the state of Massachusetts. And so they recruit around Ohio and send men first to the 54th and then to the 55th. We have hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of Ohio men leave this state to serve elsewhere because they are refused that right here. Um, they also serve in a Connecticut regiment and a Rhode Island regiment. When Governor Todd learns that the state of Massachusetts is counting these men towards the Massachusetts draft quota. So during the war, there are four drafts in the United States. There are four drafts. One, the first one Ohio doesn't have to do, they have enough volunteers, but the next three, they have to employ the draft. And once Todd hears Massachusetts is counting all those men towards Massachusetts draft, guess what he writes to Governor uh, of War, uh, excuse me, Secretary of War Edwin Stanton? We want to raise a regiment of black troops, right? Stanton says, hold on, Massachusetts isn't done. You didn't want one before. And so it takes until June of 1863 for Ohio to begin officially raising a black regiment, black men that will count towards Ohio's quota and represent the 5th USCT is first called the 127th OVI. So if you've wondered why, it's because when they start recruiting, the Bureau of Color Troops hadn't yet enforced the renaming under federal designation. So the 127th is then the 5th United States Colored Infantry. And that's Todd over there on your right. These men, at the end of June of 1863, will start uh, organizing at Camp Delaware. This is just north of Columbus on the Olentangy River. It is a segregated camp. So these men are introduced to this discrimination, first through their enlistment, uh, when the fifth learns that they will not be in Ohio Regiment, uh, and then at Camp Delaware. 
This is where they organize, this is where they train, where they muster in. And both regiments from Ohio, the 5th and 27th, will leave from Camp Delaware when they go to the uh, Virginia uh, front. I want to just say briefly, there were men that continued to enlist after the 27th filled. They go to Camp Delaware for a short time, and then any black recruits after this are sent to Camp Chase in Columbus. Almost all of these men from Ohio that aren't in the 5th and 27th go to Tennessee, where we have a mass center uh, where the US government is sending men to fill in other black regiments. I want to show this, um, first of all, to give kudos to Ohio. They are the second largest number for a free state, states that remained in the United States. We had some border states where they still had slavery. Of course, they're going to have higher numbers. But Ohio is second. But I just told you hundreds and hundreds went to Massachusetts. They're, they're included on Massachusetts up here. So we have significantly more. We should be adding more numbers to Ohio. Ohio. And, and why I want to bring this up is black men from Ohio served at a higher rate per capita than white Ohioans served in the Civil War. But we have to be fair. <laughs> we have to be fair for we're claiming those Massachusetts, right? Many men that joined the 5th and 27th came over the river from Kentucky, and I'm not sure why that part is not blue there in the middle because Kentucky's there. They came over the river uh, from Kentucky and from Virginia, which became West Virginia during the war. These are enslaved men who claim their own freedom. They run away to join. And so there are uh, significant numbers, a uh, couple hundred in, in the 5th and 27th from these states. So again, to be fair, we're going to take now down that number a little bit if we want to do it. But it doesn't take away that the Ohio black community wants to support this war, even when it's you know, still focusing on only preserving the nation. Right, and I've read lots of letters from these men, and that, they talk about this quite a bit, in addition to abolition of slavery. Here is a photograph of the 127th 5th. They are in downtown Delaware, uh, Ohio. Mm -hmm. A book, I just had the pleasure of meeting uh, Verb Washington over the weekend. It was truly uh, something I've been wanting to do for a couple decades now, so it was wonderful to meet him. And those are his, the flags, not his, the flags of the fifth. The Ohio History Connections has uh, ownership of all of our Civil War flags. When the war ended, the governor requested that they be at the State House. And they were there up until about, I don't know, 30, 40 years ago. And then they moved to the Ohio History Connection. If you ever get a chance to uh, see some of these, it's absolutely amazing. But they still smell like campfire all this time later. And we're trying to preserve them so you can see some of these have been repaired. When I show you the 27th flags, they have not. Estimates are up over 20,000 to repair some of these flags. Um, so if I win the lottery, I'll be first in line uh, to do that, uh, but very expensive for us. So this is a letter from one of the officers in the 5th, and what he is saying is he's recruiting in Toledo, and he really wants to be moved to a different part of the state because he's having trouble getting men to enlist. Why? Because of wartime uh, industry, we see wages go up for these black men. And so why would they risk those high wages compared to what they had before to join a military which at this time is paying them less than white soldiers? And he says, move me to an area where they don't have industry so I can fill my, my company. Sadly, um, Wilbur is one of the men, the white officers, that dies at Newmarket Heights. Here's the 27th. Um, I just love the cover of this. I had nothing to do with it. But Qualls Tibbs, um, I, I talked with family members. And when I found out that this picture was at the African American Museum in Washington, DC, and that they had chosen it, that's the first thing I did was contact them all, that this was going to be on the cover. Anyway, you can see the flag. <coughs> this needs some help hopefully one day. And the only photograph we have of the regiment is on the Petersburg front there. So 5th and 27th. Uh, the 5th will go to South Carolina for a short time, but like the 27th, spends almost all of the war on the Petersburg front and sometimes near Richmond. They are in the trenches. They are building the forts. They are digging the ditches and putting up the protection. They uh, labor 
under much difficulty because not only is it different climate than Ohio, but because of the uh, large entrenchments, there are always snipers. They are always under risk, even when not on the battlefield. The 27th is in the Battle of the Crater. If you haven't read about this, I encourage you. It's a fascinating, I, I don't have time to talk about it today, but the 27th from Ohio is in the first group of black men that go into just utter chaos. And what we know today, of course, is that it wasn't the black troops' fault, but they are blamed in the press for this. And this is difficult for the soldiers, knowing that they had done their best, but are being blamed for this um, fiasco. Here's what one of the soldiers that wrote home from the 27th. Let, I want to let you know that I'm still alive and well. I've been in battle. We lost a few of our boys in my company. We laid in line of battle Friday night and Saturday morning. We commenced and blew up a fort, and then we made a charge at about 5 o'clock, and we fought for about four hours. Balls flew all around me, and one man got his head partly shot off, shot off by me. I put my trust in God. He's writing this to his mother in Chillicothe, Ohio. Black troops in Ohio are rarely in the newspaper reports. We can find reports on white soldiers almost every day in Ohio Civil War newspapers, so we have to look for their own words. Um, just some of the um, casualties for the 27th. Again, not going to go in great detail. They actually do not suffer like some of the other black regiments at the Battle of the Crater. They were fortunate, even though they were in that first group. The fifth, Newmarket Heights, there at Chaffin's Farm. And if you're in Maslin, I hope you've heard of this battle. And uh, what is going to happen um, in the larger picture is that many white officers from the fifth are either wounded or killed. And several of the black non-commissioned officers take over the regiments. They take over their companies. And as a result, four men who served in the fifth out of 25, and we now say 26, somebody just recently received one, but um, out of over 20 uh, black men to receive the Medal of Honor, four came to the fourth, or to the fifth United States Colored Troops, uh, including on your far right Robert Pinn from Massillon. Both the fifth and 27th are at Fort Fisher. This was the last big hurrah, if you will, for the uh, US military. They needed to get this Confederate held uh, Fort uh, South Carolina, excuse me, North Carolina at, at the tip of Fort Fisher. The fifth goes the first time. It is an utter, utter failure. This is when Benjamin Butler is removed, for those of you that study the Civil War. The second attempt in July, uh, January of 65, the 27th goes with the fifth. This will be more successful. And I have to spend just a few minutes on this. The 27th plays a pivotal role in this battle, and you will not find this mentioned in any books um, on Fort Fisher, and I'm still a little uh, not happy about that, studying the 27th now for a couple decades. Um, we won't go over all of these, but I want you to see that our soldier that wrote home from uh, after the Battle of the Crater is writing also about this, and then you see an article from one of the men in the 27th to the Christian Recorder. This was the official newspaper of the AME Church, and one of the few places you can find letters from black soldiers writing home. And then you can see an Ohio newspaper, which says absolutely nothing about these Ohio men. So what happened is one regiment was chosen to lay in wait as white soldiers went into the fort to finally take control. And it was the 27th. And the fort falls, and, and these men, they're disappointed. They wanted to go in and help capture this fort. But then they are told some of the officers, including Lamb and Whiting, these are um, the highest ranking Confederate officers in the fort, had escaped, and they were heading southward to Battery Buchanan. And so who went after them? The 27th. And we can see here, um, this is Union County history from, I think, 1881. It is the only printed source that I have found that talks about these men taking the surrender. It's the 27th, a group of black soldiers that take the surrender at Fort Fisher. Um, the National Tribune, uh, the adjutant from the 27th, spends his life trying to get recognition for these men and himself. 
Here's another article uh, from the National Tribune. And again, afterwards, I'd be happy to pop any of these up if you want to look more closely. He's writing constantly to other officers, both in his regiment and to Confederate uh, veterans. Hey, remember when you surrendered to us? And again, this is a co he copied all, all of his letters he sent out. He copied there at the Western Reserve Historical Society. And you can see here he's writing to, to Lamb, who was a Confederate uh, officer at the fort. Here's some more. And basically what he's saying, you know it was us that took that actual surrender. Right? He's very passionate about this. Here, he even writes to the Confederate veteran. And he smooths thing, things over. Uh, I want you guys to admit you surrendered to black troops. He, he, he smooths this over uh, that he had taken from uh, the fort a little flag as well as um, some private possessions from a Confederate soldier. He says, I, I'll return these. <laughs> I, I want to find who owned them. Um, and he corresponds with that man, too. But anyway, this is how um, our history gets kind of hidden and forgotten. These men took the surrender of, of this last major fort, and, and no one talks about them. Now, again, here's an article in the AME from one of the black soldiers in the 27th and another letter home. These are after Fort Fisher Falls. And the 27th is going to remain in North Carolina. The 5th returns to uh, Virginia for a time. And what they're talking about is basically things have really calmed down. We're, we're going to be home soon. We're, we're not under the threat we were. I want to talk just a moment about black families in Ohio. They suffered greatly when these men left the state to fight. Um, in part, they're federal troops. They're not recognized as Ohio troops. So when Ohio, the state, passes a law allowing for extra taxation to support soldiers' families, there was a state tax, counties could pass an additional tax, and townships and cities could pass a third level. And all of this money would go to soldiers' families because not only did you make very little money as a private, the paymaster rarely caught up with you on a regular basis. Some of these men aren't even being paid till they you know, sign out, some of them, particularly black troops. So this money was very helpful, but it was for Ohio troops. Black families did not have men in Ohio troops. They served the federal government. By 1865, um, as Governor Todd is leaving office, he's not reelected. He is calling on Ohioans to rectify this. And eventually, by the end of the war, we will see that law all amended to include these troops. But it's really kind of too late. They've, they've suffered a great deal. And again, lack of news. What happened to my son in that battle? You, you could find a newspaper and it would list what the white troops in your community had done, but rarely, unless you had access to the Christian recorder uh, or, or some other person that had come home on leave, you would not know until your family member came home or didn't. Now, real quickly, I want to show what happened immediately when these men came home. Um, the 5th will join the 27th in North Carolina for the last months of the war, and they will remain there on occupational duty after the war ends in April. And it is not until September that these two regiments are mustered out to come home. Most Ohio troops are already home. The parades and the fanfare has already died down most communities. And this article is from a Democratic newspaper in Ohio. They were very much anti-war and they were very much anti-African-American service. And they're talking about the 27th being in Columbus to get their muster out. And they're making fun that nobody of significance is there to recognize them. You, you, know, you all said you supported these black men, but you're not here. And by the way, Grant was in Ohio when this happened, so um, it would have been nice if he'd recognized them. Uh, anyway, the last paragraph, and again, we can put it up later, they're talking about who was there. And there was a black minister who got up last to speak, and he said he had seen in another Democratic newspaper that white people were telling these black troops, don't you come home. You're not welcome here. And this black minister said, but you have your muskets. Go and tell them you're staying here. Right away, these men aren't even to their houses, to their families yet. And the animosity that had somewhat been tempered is going to be very clear. These men had offered their life to preserve this nation, to win this war. 
And many Ohioans want it to go back to the way it had been before. Now, I want to conclude by bringing Stark County into this. I have um, page, web pages for all 88 counties in Ohio that I'm putting everything that I have on my uh, regiment plus anybody else as I learn about from Ohio that served um, in the Civil War, both soldiers and sailors. And I then break it down. And so, by the way, this is a work in progress and pretty much will not even be close to done until retirement because it takes a lot of time. Uh, but then I have pages that breaks it down even further. And so we can see, um, and I'm not even sure when I took this uh, screenshot, um, how many men that we've identified from, from Massillon. But over on the right is just, I remember when I found this newspaper article on microfilm. <laughs> when you had to have microfilm. Oh my gosh, was I excited. Because there's John Mercer Langston, who was a paid recruiter. Remember I told you for the 54th uh, and 55th Massachusetts? He's one of the men that works the hardest to get Todd to agree to having black men serve from Ohio. And initially, he will help with recruiting uh, in the 5th. And here you can see he came to town. And how they, these men did this is they connected with the black churches and they asked to be part of the service. And then after the service ended, they would recruit. And you can literally see the names of some of the men, including Robert Pinn. Here um, I use other kinds of um, information. So this is after the war and it's a newspaper in Richwood, Ohio. And they're recognizing that Pinn has been made commander of the Hart Post. He is the only African-American to command a, an integrated post. We had all white posts, all African-American posts, and integrated posts. We used the census of 1890, and we can track some of these men. Here you can see um, part of a pension file. Um, the photograph came from Find a Grave. But in these, we get a lot of information, not only about the men, other men that served in a regiment, but their community. And you do so much work here in Maslin to try to make sure we have a fuller understanding of the African-American community in the 19th century. There are things in these pension files that you just can't get anywhere else. It's kind of needle in a haystack, but I, I have lots of them, so always will, I, and I have shared in the past. And by the way, I hope you all saw I thanked Mandy for that photograph. I forgot to say it out loud. Um, just, we've worked together a lot on this stuff, and I hope we have a long history of that. Um, you guys got a treasure with her here. And here's some more pension just to show you. Um, Robert Penn is the pension attorney. That's one of the things of many things he did after the war. He was a pension attorney for white and black veterans. I can't tell you how many white widows from Maslin and Stark County signed away their power of attorney to him. He had high, a very high standing in the community. We can use cemeteries and newspapers again that announced when these men passed away, newspaper articles. Again, more cemeteries. This is really great. This is in a pension file, and it's the sextant from the cemetery acknowledging that this man is buried here. Now, you all recognize him, but there are many, many communities that say we don't know anything about him. So to have somebody from a cemetery acknowledge a black veteran is incredibly important. And here is some more, a white officer in a pension file helping to uh, support these men, and then I can corroborate it. But let's just be careful. Sometimes in um, our, our research, we find many errors. That's just how it works. We always want to corroborate. Um, I know a lot about Edwin Latimer in the 27th, um, like his whole life. And uh, right here, for some reason, somebody's claiming him being buried here. He, he is not. Um, and these things happen for various reasons. So just make sure to corroborate. This is uh, myself and Mandy last year. We were absolutely privileged. It was an honor to be invited to the rededication of the Stowe Armory, which is the Pin Armory. And I want all of you to pay attention. Spring or summer, the Ohio National Guard is putting online a series of videos on all Ohio Medal of Honor winners. And there will be one on Pin. So I'm anxious to see uh, what they include uh, in that. Finding Your Roots, many, many of the people that are interviewed on Finding Your Roots, if you haven't watched this genealogical program, 
Um, it's really exciting. Um, I helped with uh, this episode that was just on two weeks ago. Boy, it'd be great to get one of those pin uh, descendants on there. Uh, but anyway, this is a way that we can recognize or learn about them. And I just want to say, I'm doing pretty good, pin. Um, there's so much we could talk about, and when I give my talk on black veterans, I go into a lot more detail. I gave you the example of his work as a pension attorney. He does much more, of course. He is the commander of the Hart uh, Post, but he also is the attorney that does the corporation, incorporation papers for the Daughters of Union Veterans. It was formed right here in Massillon. Four very young white women, daughters, wanted to be recognized, and they chose PIN to do their work for them to incorporate. Right? This man's reach, uh, again, we could just have a program on him. We need another one. I think I've actually given one on him before a couple years ago. Um, but Maslin's rich history, um, it starts before the Civil War, it continues long after. But the number of African Americans alive today that can directly relate or related to one of these men is just unbelievable and some more of you out there are probably related and I hope that we have the opportunity uh, to help you find more information about them. Thank you. I want to add to um, Robert Penn that he wanted to be in in the military so badly that he lied and said that he was Puerto Rican so that he could serve. So we're pretty proud of Robert Penn here in NASA. Okay, five questions. I know she covered it really well. Maybe we don't have any questions. <laughs> Way too fast. That was amazing. Rudy. I may ask one to reveal my ignorance. Um, many black men wanted to fight during the war, which is wonderful. Every time you say they're commanded by white troops, that seems to hint at a lot of just the segregation at that point. But my question is, there were no black officers yet. So isn't it kind of normal that there would be white officers until like New Market Heights when they start getting shot and then baptism by fire kind of kicked in? I mean, that's a great question because it's so complicated. Um, so let's go back. No black men are allowed officially in the military, so how could there have been black officers before? So that's not the reason. The reason, because once they start admitting black men, by the way, black sailors, Always, always. Black men in the Revolution, black men in the War of 1812, black men in very few, but Mexican War. I mean, so we know they're there. But officially, no. So that is one of the um, compromises, if you will, when Lincoln's, and, and by the way, Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation had nothing to do with the enslaved people. He released it as commander in chief of the military. He did it as a war measure believing if he could take the power of the enslaved people away from the Confederates the, and give them to the United States, that would be a way to end the war. Um, but inside, he, he's thinking this is, could be more. And, but he doesn't have high hopes for them. No one uh, truly believed in the military that these men would be used on the battlefield, that they would be used to dig the ditches, to drive the wagons. And that was one of the um, reasons they justified paying them less. Um, and in addition to paying them less, they also could charge them for their uniforms because they'd be doing all that hard labor. Anyway, um, so when you ask about the officer thing, it, it, there wouldn't have been any before because there were not black soldiers. Once, though, they say we're going to let black soldiers enlist, the compromise was the War Department says there will be no black commissioned officers because the belief was they were not intelligent, they would be afraid, they would turn on you. There were some, though, by the end of the war that are commissioned. So Wall, that I showed you from Oberlin, will be a captain in the 104th USCT. He did not lead troops. He was a recruiter. There were a number of black surgeons who fought to get commissioned officerships. So there are a few, but none led into battle. So that's the officer kind of question, and I think it kind of connected to your other one. Did I cover everything? I'm sorry. Yeah, they just didn't believe they were going to fight. And of course, Penn is the greatest example that they would fight. But even privates that never were recognized, let me tell you, they were willing to fight. Right. Yes, yes ma'am. So let this be a real dumb question. In all of my education, 
we were led to believe that the Civil War had to do with something of race. And now we learn, and I heard you in the last event I was, where I attended where you were, and you were great. Um, now we learn that these people, they, first of all, they weren't even looked at as citizens. And then I think we learned, you may have said it in your presentation, that it took 300 years, you were Alice when you said it took 300 years to be able to vote. So the Civil War had nothing to do with black people, had nothing to do with race. America did not even want them fighting. They had to beg to fight. Why isn't this talk, maybe this isn't your question, but I want to ask you, and I do have to leave early. I'm sorry, I'm going to be in touch with you. Why isn't this taught in the school system? Never in the history of me in education have I heard that black people were not wanted in the war. And then when I hear you say, I thought I heard you say, when the war was over, they didn't want them to come home. So they didn't even have a home to come to after you fought for a war where they didn't want you anyway. And then I go move forward to the Vietnam War during my time when I'm hearing kind of the same things and maybe that's why Muhammad Ali said no. But why isn't this taught in the American school system? I'm an African American, but I was born in America. Why isn't my history included in American history? Very very deep question that I can't do in five minutes, so let's just do a little bit of it. So one, let's recognize that a lot of the evidence that we have today was not available. And I kind of tried to say sometimes, you know, this is why this stuff disappears. Um, today we have um, projects that we are scanning materials digitally, and now there's almost a democratization of archives. So I can sit, when I started working on my dissertation on the 27th, I had to go to Washington, D.C. It's very expensive. I'm a poor little farm girl here. It was expensive. Now, some of this, I can sit in my uh, pajamas on my computer, and I can find that took me months or years before. So let's be fair that the opportunity to have access to records has been very difficult in the past. In the late 19th century, when many museums and historical societies started to professionalize, they did not seek out African-American records. So even now that we're digitizing, it's uneven. You've got to really spend time, and I always like to say, we spend time on what we value. And I call out my Civil War historians all the time that they leave these men out of the story still today. So the more we have available that then anybody can see, it's going to find its way, technically, into our school books. I say technically because right now, in 2024, even in the state of Ohio, we are facing challenges that limit what we can teach. If I taught my classes now in Florida, I could be arrested in college. And I don't think enough people are paying attention to this. So the idea that it wasn't taught before, I might find some understandable reasons. I might. Um, at the end of the 19th century, we had several black historians that were writing all kinds of things about black soldiers. Um, we have, it was called the Journal of Negro History. It's now changed the name. Um, you go to their early, um, um, issues. You can find all kinds of stuff. You gotta, you gotta go pick it up and read it, right? Um, and then it kind of disappeared to the civil rights movement and we started to see more people interested in trying to broaden the story. But again, they wouldn't have had access to the information. And I just want to touch on one other thing that you said, and we can go on with this more at another time, but so the Civil War and what people make, you know, they, there, nothing is one cause, nothing. Everything's multi-cause, everything, right? But understand this, the evidence is overwhelming. You know, I, I encourage you to challenge this by going out and studying. The Civil War is about slavery. Whether this nation was going to go forward with it or without it. It was not about states' rights. Nobody went to war and killed 700,000 Americans for a tariff. They didn't do it. Was that a reason that made some of them mad? Absolutely. Again, multi-causal. But at the end of the day, every 
claim what that war is about, peel that onion back, folks, because you go, why that? Why that? And it's always slavery. But it wasn't about the humans. Well, there was for a few people. Few people believed morally it was wrong. They did. But most people were upset about it for economic and political reasons or their own moral well-being, right? How can I know about this and ever get to heaven if I haven't tried to end this? It was about themselves. And, and that's just what the evidence is out there overwhelming. And so when you said coming back, even Ohio, Ohio is one of the first states that um, approves the 14th Amendment, the Citizenship Amendment. It's one of the first states to, to say, yes, we will help you. We have about two years later, midterm elections, Democrats take over. And by the way, if you're not familiar with the 19th century, if we use today's language, it's not exact, but uh, Republicans would have been the liberal, the left on the political spectrum, and Democrats were the conservative on the right side, right? So Democrats took over the state house um, after Ohio had said yes to the 14th Amendment, and they rescinded it. Ohio said, we do not approve of the 14th Amendment. We do not recognize these people as our equal citizens. And you're absolutely right. When the war breaks out, Dred Scott made it clear they were not and would never free or enslave people. And they were not considered human by many. And the oh, state of Ohio, after the Civil War, says, we are not going to still recognize them as citizens. So one of the things I always like to ask my students is, when do you think Ohio ratified the 14th Amendment? Does anybody know? And then I make them guess, and that's like pulling teeth. Somebody want to throw out a year for me? When do you think Ohio ratified it? By the way, it was already part of the Constitution, so this is just, you know, if you're on Jeopardy, I guess, but I mean, it's, it really matters. Give me a year, somebody. 1922. Someone said 1922, higher. 50. 1950, higher. 1965, higher. 1972, higher. Close, 2003. An intern at the State House discovered it while doing some research and went up and asked the co state congressman, what, what is this? And boy, did Ohio have a really quick ceremony. Oh, wait, we do. We, we, we agree. So stuff like that, right? We can't just talk about the South and the enslavers, right? We have to talk about everywhere in the United States. So the war was not about slavery in the rhetoric. It was preserving the United States but it was to preserve the United States because it was challenged by, by the issue of slavery. You, you can't take it out of there. And I think that's why a lot of people um, struggle with teaching it, particularly based ge on geography. Where are you at? You know, how do you teach this? And it has to do with the sources not being out there. It has to do with school boards not replacing textbooks for 20 and 30 years. Right? I, there's so many reasons that we don't talk about it this way. And I'll just piggyback on that. You know, when I teach college students, there are many that say, what are you talking about? I mean, they, I have students now that have never heard of the Civil War. So I hope I got some of that. But wonderful question, deep question, and we need to work on it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you got a card. Yes. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I think he had his hand up first. Go ahead. Uh, in my local research, I uh, found several uh, black uh, runaway slaves who ran away to army camps where they, like the man in your first example, were taken in as cooks and orderlies. Do you know if those people were given uh, vet were veteran status and vetera veteran rights? So they were not, and I did mean to kind of make reference to that in the other photograph that Mandy had shared with me. So they are not eligible for a uh, um, pension, but a few of them try. And if they tried, their records are held at the National Archives. So don't, don't ever say, I'm not going to look there. It is possible, and I've seen a few, and they'll say to the person, you're denied because you served in this capacity. You were never a soldier. And um, if you have the names and you're interested afterwards, I can share with you um, somebody that does it very inexpensive if you can't go to DC relative uh, to, to what other people charge. And he does great work. So if you want to try, and I can even help you where you look. But anyway, they were not eligible for pensions. Eventually, some nurses were 
able to get pensions, but if you were a paid servant. And, and oh, I want to add another thing. I thought about this. How do you find these men? Um, how you find them is the white officer who employed them would have asked for food and pay on their own pay stubs. You'd see this. So the only true piece of history from the 27th that I own is one of these pay master sheets for an officer in the 27th, and it lists the name of his paid servant, it lists how many meals he got, and his pay. And so, again, needle in a haystack, but you just start going through those white officers in the 13th until we, you know, maybe find one. Um, so there's ways to get at this stuff. It just takes a long time, and it's just great fun, and, and it's, it's a great honor to try to bring their stories to light. One more. Uh, I see up front and then in, in the back. Okay, let me Do we have a front? Uh, his hand, I think, was up first in the front. He was first? No. Oh, no? Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead, sir. I can't even how close was the New York to the Civil War? So I use it, I like it, I love it, I, for the fact that it shows the diversity of the black men who serve. The Ill illiterate enslaved person, if you remember the scene where he has to be taught right and left, does not mean he's stupid, right? He just never had to know that before. All the way up to the uh, black uh, soldier who is friends with Shaw, who is highly educated. And I think that did a great job of showing that diversity. Um, I don't do battles per se, but I understand, and, and, and maybe later um, Mr. Smith could share his opinion on some of this, but. Um, some people that um, are into the military battles are not happy that something's wrong in there about an angle or a direction. Um, I, I'm not going to get upset about that uh, because it introduced so many Americans that had no clue about the United States color troops. Again, almost 10% of all U.S. forces. Uh, it does a great job for Hollywood. Um, I'll, I'll just tell you one scene that is inaccurate. Denzel Washington's character is whipped for um, being absent without leave, no white officer of the United States Colored Troops did that. They did punish, but none of them. And I think that was there to try to make a point that many of these uh, black men felt they were going from one master to another. And we understand military service, you don't have a say, you do what you're told, right? But if you've never been in the military, and you don't know that, and you're leaving, you know, so I, I think it was a very important scene to help us to understand that, but none of them had used a whip as punishment. So yeah, I like it a lot, but if you're into battles, go ahead and read what somebody says about that. <laughs> yeah. I think that we should hold the rest of the questions and Kelly's willing to stay. Absolutely. I cannot thank you enough for this beautiful, beautiful program for Black History Month. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.